So Judy and I have known each other for years. I interviewed her like five years ago for my podcast, and I did it because she was my competitor. And I was like, okay, interviewing her, I'll know what she's doing, and I can understand the business model. But it turns out I liked her so much that, well, we became collaborators instead, which is way more fun. And then last year, the Ordev conference in Sweden, we were having a few beers together, and then a few more beers. And by the end of the night, we are like, we really should be collaborating together. We really should do it. So we've developed the remote meetings masterclass together and have had a really, really good time. So uh, it's really fun. And my slides are not showing. Oh, here we go. OK. Uh, so I've changed the name of the talk. It is still going to be the same content about how to be a high-performing, distributed, agile team. But what I found is um, the remote practices are actually good across whether you're agile or not. They're kind of the same for all teams, whether you're agile or not. Um, so I will address that. Um, the other thing to note is I am not related to Jeff Sutherland. It is a total coincidence. So this is a software that everybody always asks. So no relation. We've never met yet. And uh, so uh, we'll go with that. So I know that distributed teams is becoming more and more the norms. And of course, now with the virus, it's sort of becoming imperative that people were getting, Judy and I are both getting contacted every day by people who are saying, hey, my team has quarantined and we need to work from home or we need to work remotely um, help. And so uh, that's been really fun. And I'm assuming that you're here because you're here to collect tips and best practices and some tools maybe for how to work remotely successfully. So that's what I'm hoping to do today is just to instill some good tips and some tools along the way. I'm a total tool junkie. I don't make any money from any of the tools I'm going to show. I'm not an affiliate or anything. I'm just a slavish fangirl. So uh, all of the things that I'm going to be showing you today are from the interviews that I've done on the podcast over the last five years. I've interviewed hundreds of teams on how they're working remotely. So if you're interested in that, all the videos and the podcast are available online for free. And if you want, I just published my book last year, uh, Work Together Anywhere. And so that's available on Amazon. And I'd like to show it. It's a real book. Sometimes people will put up a graphic, and then you get like a little pamphlet in the mail. It is a real book. Um, so uh, if you're interested in that, you can get that on Amazon. So the thing that I've learned from all the interviews that I've done is that there is no one right way to work remotely. What works for one team is not going to necessarily work for the other team, even within the same company. I wish there were a silver bullet, because uh, Judy and I would make a million dollars selling everybody a silver bullet for how to do it well. But the name of the game is experimentation and taking things that work for you. So what I'm hoping to do today is give you a whole bunch of ideas and that you will take from those ideas what you think might work for your team. Because when we get it right, great things happen. We as individuals get a lot of freedom. We get the freedom to work where we're most productive, to avoid the commute, to spend more time with our families, uh, train for marathons, all kinds of things like that. And companies get a stronger and more connected workforce, uh, which is uh, really what companies are going for. So it can be a win-win situation when we get it right. So my agenda for today is I want to actually dive into two aspects of remote work. One is how to perfect your own game. And then the other aspect is how do we work together online with people as if they were in the office with us? Um, so we'll go over that. And we'll start with perfecting your own game and how to tend to your own needs. And these are things that are going to sound very, very simple. But there's a catch. And I'll, I'll tell you the catch at the end. So perfecting your own game. I keep clicking here, and I should be clicking there. So the first, of course, is to find why are you working distributed? Is it because you have to? You were forced into it? Um, you know, you're working with teams all over the world just by nature because software development works that way. Or maybe you want to be a digital nomad and travel the world. Or maybe you just want to spend time with your family or avoid the commute. And it is actually really important to figure it out why you're doing it, because then you can design the lifestyle around your why. So just give, giving that some thought. And the next is you have to find where you're most productive. So for me, it's in my home office. I like to be totally alone and isolate. I don't have the isolation, the loneliness that many remote workers have. For others, my husband tried working from home, hated it, went back to the office within six months. Other people really like co-working spaces. Um, you can see here, this is somebody who's actually rented a mobile van, and they travel around in this van. They're actually from the UK. They travel around in the van and go to uh, southern Europe during the winter so that they can uh, stay warm. Um, and everybody has a different style. So it's really important to figure out what is your style? Where are you most productive? And then, of course, finding your daily rhythm. 
So uh, my husband is a total morning person, 7 a.m. the alarm goes off and somehow he is out the door by 7.30 having, having showered and eaten and everything. And I'm like still barely getting my eyes open. I'm a total night owl. Um, so it's really important. Are you a morning person? Are you an evening person? Do you have a forced schedule? which means that you have a time box in which you have to work, you know, because the kids come home from school at 3 p.m. And so if it's not done by then, you don't have a chance later in the day uh, to, to get that done. So you really have to figure out what is your own daily rhythm. And it's a lot harder than you might think. And of course, finding your boundaries. So if you're working from home or if you're working from a co-working space, um, so, well, I should say, a lot of managers don't like letting people work remotely or go flexible because they're worried that the work won't get done. And actually what, what we're finding is the opposite is true. Because we're able to blend work and life uh, so seamlessly that people tend to overwork and not turn off. And burnout is a far bigger issue uh, than laziness. And so that's a, that is actually really the issue in the name of the game. So it's really important to figure out what are your boundaries you know, for me, I turn the phone off at 9 p.m. at night, and I don't turn it on again until 9 a.m. the next day. And like, that is my boundary. That works for me, it doesn't work for other people. Some people have to set specific working hours. Some people use separate devices. Whatever it is that you use to find your own boundaries, you have to set them for yourself. And of course, I mentioned the loneliness thing. That's the number one thing that remote workers tend to complain of, and that is, I'm in my house all the time. Um, I'm all by myself. And the thing is, you really have to figure out what are your social needs. Like for me, I could be a hermit. I could stay in my room for a month probably, not talk to anybody, and I'd be a-okay with that. Probably not healthy, but I could do it and it wouldn't be a problem. Other people would go crazy, and so you need to figure out, do you need to go out and talk to people? You have to build your own social life. When we go to the office, we're kind of given a social life there. And when we leave the office, we have to build it for ourselves, and that can be really difficult. Luckily, there's some fun options out there besides just going to your local coffee shop, and that is you can do virtual co-working now. I ran a virtual co-working space for years. Um, this right here is a friend of mine, Gretchen. We worked together eight years ago writing a different book, um, and she's in California. I'm in the Netherlands, and we just would get together uh, every evening for a few hours and write together. And when the project ended, we liked working together so much that we have continued to this day eight years later. And I met her for the first time in December uh, after eight years, and she is really short, which I didn't realize, of course, when you're working online, because <laughs> you see everybody in the same size. So that was the only weird thing. Um, that came from that. There's also many tools. This one is Focusmate. So you could actually get together with somebody random from around the world, log in, you begin by telling each other what you want to accomplish in the next hour, and then you check in with each other at the end of the hour. What did you get done? What did you do? Another form of virtual co-working. So sounds a little bit strange, but something may be worth trying. And of course, there are virtual offices. So if you're working with a team, these are some of my favorite things. What you're looking at is a floor plan of an office, and these are two different styles. This one is Remo, and this one is Walkabout Workplace. But what you can see is you're looking down into a floor plan. Each one of these squares represents a separate room, and you can see that there's people in the rooms. You can only see and hear the people that are in the same room with you, but you simply double click to go to another room to be with another group of people. So I love these things for in terms of offices. This can be a great way instead of saying, hey, are you available next week at 2 p.m.? You can actually now virtually knock on people's doors. This can also give you a sense of presence and a sense that there is a team around you, even if you're working alone in your own space. So I said before, a lot of these things sound really simple and that there was a catch. And there is a catch. And I love this. If you haven't seen the, the cartoon from The Oatmeal, this one is awesome. And it says, why working from home is both awesome and horrible. And I put why working from anywhere is both awesome and horrible. It's awesome because we have so much freedom. And it's horrible because we have so much freedom. And I'd like to make the analogy between uh, this and weight loss. Like we know the formula for weight loss, right? It's eat less and exercise more, but it is really hard to do. For anybody that's tried losing weight, it is really hard to do. So all of these things of find your why and figure out your boundaries and implement your own social needs, it sounds really simple and it is surprisingly difficult for people to do. 
So don't underestimate some of these things in terms of if you're going out and doing these things on your own, don't underestimate maybe the, the difficulty there. Oh, so I'm going to do Slido because I want to see what people are, uh, what, I want to take sort of the pulse of the room. And I hate to get everybody out on their phone because all of a sudden, like, oh, Twitter. Uh, but what I'd like to do is just go to Slido and I'd like to answer, how would you perfect your own game? How would you perfect your own game? Would you first find your why? Do you need to find where you're most productive? Where, what would you do? And let's all put the results on the screen. So let's see what we got. All right, we've got two people. And you could already be perfect. That's also an option. I haven't had a room full of perfection yet, though. Got a few perfect, perfect people. So it sounds like finding the daily rhythm of like what do you need in order to, to get your day going is a really big one. And I found that I struggle with that also. For me, my, my daily rhythm is I wake up and I kind of I do coffee and Twitter to read the news to make sure everything's still sort of okay-ish. And, uh, and then I, with my pajamas on, I go up into my office and I work for a few hours. And then around noon, I like to go running or go do errands or yoga or something like that. And then I come back in the afternoon. And it took me a while to find that, but it ended up being what I like. Great. So you can continue to vote. I can send out the results, but we can get an idea of the room. A lot of perfection. Okay. So now, though, now that we've found our own needs, how do we work together with a team online? And I want to start by creating alignment. We've, I've heard a lot of talking about this. And I didn't see Mark's talk because I had an Ask Me Anything uh, session, but I'm sure Mark talked about this in his talk, and that is I tell every team, whether you're new or not, to start by creating an agreement together on how you're going to work. What tools are you going to use? Where are you going to store the information? How are you going to communicate with each other? How will you know what each other are doing? Are there expected response times? All of these kind of things that are explicit when we go to the office, we need to really make them, or they're implicit when we go to the office, we need to make them explicit when we go online because we can't see each other. So we really need to define how are we going to work together as a team? What is normal for us? And when somebody joins a team, it's really nice when you have a team agreement in place because they can automatically slip into that way of working. And then when you review the team agreement, which should be done very regularly because teams evolve and tools evolve, that then they have input into the next version of it. So I interviewed Bayat Bulman, who is the head of EMEA for Evernote. And they have some pretty intense processes at Evernote for what they do. They actually have etiquettes for how they run their meetings for how they write their emails, for what's required in their home office. Oh, pictures. No. <laughs> and uh, how are they going to do their tasks? And what are some of their Slack etiquettes? And so they just go through and they just define this with their team to get rid of the basic misunderstandings that are going to happen, um, because they're always going to happen. So if you, you're, you're going to have bigger misunderstandings, of course. So just get rid of the basics um, so that you can sort of become aligned in how you're working. And if you'd like, I've got some templates on the website if you want to download a team agreement template. There's many different forms. There is one that just defines information, communication, and collaboration. There's also this team canvas. This is not mine. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not, I would, uh, Creative Commons. But you can d download that as well. It doesn't matter what you use for your team agreement in terms of templates or types. It just matters that you have the conversation with your team. Um, so definitely check that out. So now I want to talk about presence, because going to work in the modern day workplace looks very different than it did just 10, 20 years ago. So how do we create pre presence in this new way of working? And of course, the number one, which you've heard all day, is we've got to turn the cameras on. And you know the, 
a lot of people don't like it. I can already see like, oh, I hate turning the cameras on or my team doesn't do it or we don't have enough bandwidth or the tool that we use doesn't do it. But really what Judy said this morning, the time has come. There's no excuses anymore unless you have really bad bandwidth and then you really need to get good bandwidth because it is the cornerstone of remote working, like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Wi-Fi is at the bottom. That is a critical component of remote working. If you don't have that, you are doomed. It's really there. So you need Wi-Fi and then turning the cameras on. And that brings us to our next Slido question, which is, if you don't already turn your camera on, why not? I need to set the next... Uh, Poll. So let's just see, what are some of the reasons why people don't turn their cameras on? And if you do turn your camera on, that's also an option. And it's getting more and more common now for people to do that. But many people just don't like it. They don't like seeing themselves on camera. That's a valid excuse. Most tools now have the ability to hide yourself from your own view but you're still present to other people's views. So they are working through some of these things. And not surprisingly, the multitasking one comes up. That's the number one reason that people don't turn their cameras on. It's because they're multitasking and they don't want anybody to know it. And then you have to question, well, why are they in that meeting to begin with, right? Okay, distracting things in the background in your casual clothes. Now I can say if you're in your casual clothes, just put on a normal shirt or a scarves work really well. So then, you know, you're only visible from here on up. So just put on a real shirt and turn the cameras on. <laughs> Please. Two monitors. An external monitor, absolutely. One for the people and one for your document. 100%. Yeah. And some people don't like external monitors. I have like four at them. I have like a hub of operations. But really, it's the, it's the key. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And on the background thing on Zoom, you just kind of take background in the space, so that's not either. Exactly. Virtual backgrounds now. Or a, uh, I used to have uh, my bed. I had a really small apartment for a long time, and my bed was right behind my workstation. <laughs> And I just got one of those room dividers that was pre-virtual backgrounds. You just put up the room divider and professional. Because I give workshops online for a living. And the last thing I want is for people to see my bed in the background. Like, that's not the most professional look. So you're not going to sell workshops to KLM with a bed in the background. I'll tell you that. Great. So some other ways uh, that people are using the camera, I think, are pretty interesting. This is a team in Germany that has teams in two cities. So there's, uh, and each team is working in one room. So they have like teams of six in one room. And what they've done is they've just connected with the camera. So they have video and sound on in each place. And what they've done is simulated what it's like to work in the same room together. On this other board over here, they've got their task board. So it's like the sticky notes on the wall. And then when a task gets done, they just use their virtual uh, sticky note board to move tasks along. I think they're just using some sort of a Kanban flow or a, and even a virtual tool would be fine there. So this is what they've done. And they basically are just connected with sound and video for the entire day. And that's how they work together. This is a team in Australia that is working with teams in China. And they have hundreds of people in their office when I went to visit them. And what they've done is that they've just put up these giant monitors throughout the office. They might have 50 of them throughout the office with the sound and video on, and that connects them to their Chinese colleagues throughout the day. They do their stand-ups here. They hang out. You can see that this is their hangout area. They're playing video games together. So this is how they've used video to connect both offices. And it's not that expensive anymore to get these nice big uh, monitors and some good webcams and some good speaker phones um, and it really does keep the, keep the team connected so it's not just about you know video on there's some creative things that we can do and if you'll allow me to just for a few minutes ah yes that is uh, that is a very good issue yeah so it, you know if you're working in a bank for example then this is might not be the setup that you would want for yourself so yeah, privacy, especially with video, is going to be an issue. And you just, have to be, you just have to set up rules for your company around what's acceptable and what's not, for sure. So not all of these things. I'm not saying do all of these things. I'm saying pick and choose 
what do you think might work for you? And I would really highly encourage experimentation because sometimes the thing that you think will work totally doesn't work and there's a random reason why. It's not rational all the time, which is very frustrating. So I'd like to just poke a little bit into the weird, a world of weird. So I'm gonna show you some weird things that are happening, but I wanna let you know where the market's going and what the potential is. And so uh, the first thing is the telepresence robots, of course. This is the Beam Pro that's made by Suitable Technologies. You've probably seen it on the Big Bang Theory. That's where it became like really popular and everybody knew what it was. They're basically drivable robots, person height, and you can drive them using the arrow keys on your keyboard. Now at the Suitable Technologies office, 50% of their workforce beam in via robot, and 50% are there in the flesh, and this is how they work every day. And of course, it changes the etiquettes and the, the culture of the office, so you can't shake hands with people, of course, so instead you fist bump, because that's a much more 2D version. So there's all these new etiquettes that start to come up. And I want to just show a quick video of what this, lo uh, what this looks like, so you get a little bit of a feel. So it's about a minute and a half, and this robot I don't like as much because it's like belly button height, which is a very awkward, height for talking with somebody. So uh, it's not ideal, but you get a bit of a sense of how it works. While sat at my desk in San Francisco, I can roam the corridors in Cambridge, Massachusetts, seeking out people in their offices, attending meetings, and joining in with gossip in the kitchen. But replacing a person with a machine is not always straightforward. In our January issue, I take a look at the social side of becoming and working with a robot Controlling one of these telepresence robots is like using a video chat program with a few extra controls to steer yourself around. You can do most of the things that you would do in person. For example, stopping to talk with people you meet. The Dominican Republic was great, Tom. They're trying to get a two-year-old baby yes. down to the Dominican Republic was difficult. Oh, all right. Well, I'm sure he liked it when he got there. Yeah. Or having a conversation as you walk down a corridor alongside someone because you can get a feel for the space around you and watch people's body language, those conversations are much like those you would have face to face. Or belly button I got belly much button. more out of our morning meeting as a robot than I would dialing in on the phone as usual. And the people there could talk to the machine as if it was me. Okay. So you get the idea. Uh, but, you know, it sounds a bit silly, but these type of telepresence robots really create presence in a room with the team. Um, and it feels, it's a little bit weird at first until you get used to it, and then it's not weird anymore, just like any new technology. Now this one right here, we're gonna take, take another step further into the weird, this is virtual reality. This one in particular is called Roomy, it's virtual reality for remote teams, and you put on your glasses, you walk into your virtual office, down your virtual corridor, into your virtual conference room, to stand around your virtual whiteboard with your colleagues, have your stand-up meetings, or just hang out together in this virtual space. And I know it sounds weird, and it is, until you get used to it, and virtual reality's been around for over 20 years now, and it hasn't really caught on in the workforce, and it's because it's hard to learn how to use. It has been hard, but I think it is going to make a bigger splash uh, as we continue. And if you thought that that was the last weird thing, it's not. I want to quickly talk about holograms uh, because I think there's some really cool developments that have been happening in this space, and I'm a big Star Wars fan. Um, but I want to show you uh, a couple of tools. This one is called Spatial. So it is a hologram tool where you can actually beam into places. So this is one of the first ones that I've seen on the market. Um, but there's some really cool things. So Microsoft came out with a HoloLens last year. Oh. I gave it away, darn, before the Microsoft one. Back in 2012 at Coachella, Snoop Dogg performed in real life with Tupac as a hologram. So I'm also a big Snoop Dogg fan. So on the left here, Snoop Dogg, who is there in real life. That's Tupac, who died years ago before this and came back as a hologram. And I wanna show you about a minute of them performing together at the Coachella Festival, just so you can see how realistic holograms can be. If you didn't know that Tupac wasn't there live, yeah, you probably wouldn't realize that this was a hologram. Oops. Shit. 
Now that cost millions to make. Of course, we're not gonna be doing that on our teams anytime soon, but pretty realistic and pretty amazing to see that. Now last year, Microsoft came out with their HoloLens technology. So this was just last year, and I wanna show you a video clip of the hologram technology that they've, they've come up with. Oops, having mouth problems. Here we go. First, let me introduce you to Minnie Me. There she is, my perfect hologram. And thanks to the power of HoloLens 2, she just floats right with me. I'm literally holding my hologram, so natural. Now she's a little small to do a keynote. So let's get her up so she can do full size Japanese keynote. Render, keynote. Hologram になるときには本当に驚くべきことがあります。私たちは最新の複合現実キャプチャー技術を使用し、私のホログラムを作成しています。So cut it, so you can. This is mind-blowing technology. And what you just saw was my life-size hologram, my exact replica, rendered here in real time, speaking Japanese with my unique voice signature. To do this, we use mixed reality technology to create my hologram and render it here live. Then we use Azure speech-to-text capability and English transcription to get my speech. Then use Azure Translate to get the speech into Japanese. And finally, applied neural text-to-speech technology so it sounded exactly like me, just speaking Japanese. And the most amazing part? All of these technologies exist today. The future is here. So now most of us are still struggling with Skype for business, for God's sakes, and <laughs> spider phones right in the middle of the desk, so we're way off with that. And I, so the holograms are not coming anytime soon. Uh, however, I, I think that the potential of what we can do now with technology is extremely uh, exciting. And we can do a lot better than Skype for Business. I mean, you could almost do anything would be better than Skype for Business at this point. Um, so get a real video conferencing tool. It doesn't have to be holograms, but I just like to show what, what's coming. So uh, I said I was a tool junkie. I've got a list of hundreds of tools on my website if you want to check that out. However, it's not about the tools. It's about the behavior that the tools enable us to have. So creating presence by using various video technologies tools is pretty cool, but you can also create presence in other ways. And that is with a concept called working out loud. And I got this from John Stepper who wrote the book called Working Out Loud. And he wrote it because he was working for Deutsche Bank and he was the only person in his department that was doing his particular function and nobody else knew what he was doing. And his department was being downsized and he was in danger of losing his job because nobody knew what he was doing. And I thought, ah, that is exactly what's happening with remote work. We're out of sight, out of mind. People don't know what we're doing. And so we need to figure out ways of working out loud. And whether we do that by video technology or holograms or just by keeping each other updated in daily stand-ups, one of the ways that we work better remotely is by doing our work out loud with our teammates. So it's not about the tool, it's about the behavior. But the tools are really cool. So, okay, I have to remember to take a breath after the tools because I get excited. Okay. So in terms of now we've got uh, alignment, we've got presence, and now how do we create camaraderie? How do we create that sense of team and that sense of fun that we have together when we're, uh, that we have when we're working together in the office? And there's different ways to do this. One is you can build it into your regular day, which is uh, a fun way to do it, and I'll show some ways to, of doing that. One is icebreaker questions for all of your meetings. 
So, you know, favorite food, why are you here? What will you contribute to this meeting? Favorite color. And the real reason for icebreakers in meetings is one, to get everybody talking before the meeting starts because science shows that once everybody has spoken, they're more likely to speak up again. And the second reason is because over time, we start to learn things about each other. It's not just Bob from engineering, it's Bob from engineering that takes his kids canoeing on the weekends and he loves the color green and he goes to Hawaii on vacation and suddenly through these simple questions we've now learned a lot about people so icebreakers are an easy way to do a, to, to build camaraderie into your day this picture is take a picture of your shoes or take a picture of your feet and show us what's on your feet right now something really simple part of a holiday party we had then of course there's group chat channels that is this is your natural virtual water cooler of course everybody's got this this one's on slack but you can have a books channel a pets channel some people have a humble brag channel because sometimes you want to be like i just did something really cool uh, or a goal channel it doesn't matter what it is but use it as your virtual water cooler and of course you instead of just building things into the day we have to schedule our serendipity because unless you're working in a virtual office, you're not going to accidentally bump into people online. So we actually have to schedule it. And many teams are doing virtual coffees. So you just get together, you know, every Wednesday at noon, there's a virtual coffee. Whoever wants to show up, shows up and you hang out, you have coffee, 15 minutes, and then you go back to work. So a standing. So a lot of teams are experimenting with things like this. There's virtual lunches. It's weird to eat on screen, that's the only, that's the only thing, but you get, you get used to it over time. There's quiz nights, of course. There's video games, which people don't think of, but video games are a great way of connecting across borders, is just hang out and play some games together online. So we forget that there's a lot of different ways that we can have fun and build serendipity into our teams. And uh, I've got a huge list of virtual team building activities, so I just gave a few of the more common ones, but if you want to, uh, to check out the list, there's a huge list of uh, lots of different team building activities. What it takes is a bit of creativity and a champion to make it happen. Because if you leave these things to chance, chances are they're not gonna happen. So you really need somebody to take the lead and to be the spirit and champion these activities on the team. Okay, so in terms of Team building, our last Slido poll for the day. What team building activities appealed to you? Let me go set the, the next question. We get a sense of what, uh, what people liked. And there's no other, I'm sorry, I forgot the other category. Lots of icebreaker questions, of course. Those are super easy. You can build them into any meeting, any function, anything. And virtual coffees and lunch are also fun. All right, I'll continue. So. Okay. So. We've uh, tended to our own needs, we've created alignment, we've created presence, we've got some camaraderie and fun going on in our team. And the next thing that I really put in here was, we've got to learn how to host great online meetings. Because right now, online meetings are like a level of Dante's hell. And the more online meetings we go into, the worse it gets, right? Like everybody just hates them. Um, but I think that it can be changed. I think that online meetings need to be good because that's the way that as teams we're communicating and hanging out together. So it's worth spending some time learning how to design and facilitate online meetings. And if you were at Judy's talk this morning, you got a lot of good tips, uh, but here are a few more. This was one of my favorite quotes from the interviews that I did, which was, people think that they want to be co-located, but what we really want is high bandwidth communication. We want to be able to talk to our teammates as if they're in the same room with us. And I make this analogy, I'm also a huge Star Trek fan, so I make this analogy with Star Trek is, let's see if I can get it. Jamie to bridge. Chakotay here. We want it to be this easy. Jamie to bridge, report. It's close enough. Bridge, start the decompression sequence. Acknowledged. Janeway to con. Paris here, Captain. Janeway to Chakotay. I'm here, Captain. We're pinned down. I can see you from here. 
right? So that's what we want on our team. It doesn't, we want, we don't want to have the coffee shop sounds. It's not Lisette to Bridge and then there's barking dogs and coffee shops and car sounds. No, it's Lisette to Bridge, Bridge Reports, crystal clear communication. So it is worth investing in good equipment. And I always say that great online meetings are, well, as Judy quoted me this morning, that was fun, uh, that it's a combination of good infrastructure and good facilitation. So if you're using Skype for Business, really chuck it into the river, get some, or, or into a, recycle it uh, into responsibly, and uh, get, a, get a real video tool. Invest in a nice headset. If you're working in an open office, Logitech has great oh, so certified open office headsets now that will cancel out the background noise. There's tools like Crisp that will also take background noise out. But really invest in good infrastructure. If you're having these horrible hybrid meetings where some people are in the room and some people are remote, get a meeting owl, one of the 360 degree microphone and cameras that auto focuses, uh, learn, you know, these kind of things. There's a lot that we can do to improve the quality of our online meetings simply through infrastructure. And then the other is facilitation skills. We need to design our meetings differently. And I think one of the reasons that online meetings are so bad is because we took the in-person meeting and we translated it directly online. And it didn't translate well, it turns out. So in terms of meeting design, what I mean by that is there's a lot of preparation that we can do before the meeting starts. So for example, if you come to an online meeting and somebody's going to give an online 20 minute presentation, why are we here? Why did we not record that presentation as a video before the meeting starts so that we can use our valuable online time together for decision making and discussions? So you want to make sure that you're designing the meetings differently so for maximum engagement. So this is, of course, the old style meeting room, right, with the old conference uh, spider phone in the middle where it's like, hey, Bob, it's Lisette, can you hear me? And, uh, you know, Bob sort of uh, answers. So this is the old style. And now we're moving to this more sophisticated style um, of meeting rooms if you're going to do hybrids. So this is the remote participants are very present in this room. You can see them. You can hear them. Every, everybody's able to see the materials being presented. This is key. Ah, here's the meeting owl. So it looks like a cute little owl. You can see it sits in the center of the table. And for the remote participant, and I'm sorry about the black line cutting in, but the remote participants, this is what they can see on the top here. They see the whole scan of the room and the meeting owl will automatically focus on the person who's speaking. So small changes like this that can really improve the infrastructure of our meetings. And of course, facilitation skills because remote is different. And I, uh, a lot of, because my enthusiasm for remote, people think like, oh, I think remote is better all the time. It's not. It depends on the situation. Some people work better in person and it needs to be that way. And some people work better remote. And it's just to recognize it's different. It's different. So a uh, quick plug, uh, Judy and I have developed the Remote Meetings Masterclass last year and it's been selling like hotcakes. It's crazy. I think people are really suffering in their online meetings. We're doing a course tomorrow and we run them regularly online. So if you ever want to join us, um, uh, it's a really fun class. We have a good time together. Oh, if you use the QCon code, just say that you're from QCon. There's always a discount, a 20% discount. I think we've set it up for that. So I have to remember to breathe. Distributed is becoming more and more the norm. And now with this virus, it's sort of kind of come on. Uh, it's become imperative for people. So I think it's a, I'm hoping that you got some good tips and tricks today. And just remember, there is no one right way. What works for one team is not going to work for the other. And when we get it right, we get freedom for people to do what we want to do and design our lives the way we want them designed. And companies get a stronger and more connected workforce. Um, and I think that's really good. And the way that we do that is we perfect our own game as remote workers and we learn how to work together online as if we're in the office together. And I think with the technology that exists today, the excuses are becoming less and less. It's more a matter of learning what the technology is and then, and then implementing it. So I wanted to just end. Um, I've got a super kit online that if you want to download, it's got icebreakers and tips for time zones and all kinds of things. That's my timer, sorry, that was a little loud. Uh, so it's time to, time to finish. Tips for time zones, and you can just download that. It's a whole kit. Um, and I think I'll just end there.
for now since my timer just went off. So thank you for staying. I know it's been a really long day. It's hard to be the, one of the last talks at a long conference like this, but I hope that there were some tips and some entertainment that you got. So thank you. Thank you.